can you hear us and see the presentation? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So shall we start? Uh, Sophia will present this journal talk about the timing of uh, artificial speech operation. How does it affect outcome? Please, Sophia. Hi, hello everybody. Hopefully you've got the paper from my leg already. Um, so I'm just going to go through this paper and then I have at the end just included our in-house data of the last year, just to compare to the paper really. So um, this is an American paper from Philadelphia. It's looking at associations between variations in preoperative care before switch procedure and then the outcomes. And as I say, we're trying to take a critical appraisal approach, which Sean will do anyway, but just a reminder for myself as much as anyone that we want to see if the study is um, addressing a clear question and then look at the methods and how valid they are, look at the results, and then determine whether we think these results are generalizable to our population. So the paper gave a good summary and background and we have been doing the TGA for a few weeks now in Heart Talk, so this is nothing new to anyone, but just as a recap, um, it just states that TGA is the second most common form of cyanotic heart disease, and the arterial switch has now replaced the atrial switch. They give a mortality of around 5%. Our um, European guidelines say 3 to 5%, so similar. And then the authors say that there's already been a fair amount of research looking at birth weight and coronary anatomy, hospital and surgeon experience and their effect on operative mortality. But they, cl they claim there's other preoperative care aspects that haven't been looked at in terms of outcome, and that's what they set out to do. Um, a bit more background, really, again, it's really straight from the paper, and we have been covering it in the previous weeks, but just the one of the big factors is um, being hypoxic before surgery and um, mixing mixing of blood at atrial level, atrial level or duct level, etc. So um, the main way to stop this hypoxia is obviously having the switch done. But they talk about the adjuvant therapies that you can use to improve oxygen saturations before you get to switch. And the three, the four things they look at really are um, septostomy, using prostin, ventilation and inotropes. And they talk about using these to give a window of time when looking at when the switch is performed and then acknowledge that they've got risks and complications. So their aims were quite clear and focused, I think. They were just looking at these associations of preoperative care and the preoperative outcomes. And they've focused down on those factors we've just mentioned. And then um, the outcomes they're looking at, they've got three main ones, mortality, cost and um, length of hospital stay. <laughs> So I think it's a clear question, sorry. Just pausing for a minute. People coming in. So you can join in teams on any station. Yeah, I think we just need to Okay, thank you. So, so I thought the question was quite focused, so I always thought the study was clear in that. Um, and then moving on to the methods they've used. So they've used, they've done a multi-centre study retrospective. So that's that's good that it's multi-centre. And they've used a database, an American database called um, Pediatric Health Information Systems. And that is looking at data from 47 hospitals. So the data is already inputted. And they say this data has had a number of uh, reliability and validity checks, which I assume to be correct. Um, how they selected the study is they used ICD codes, which they claim are more sensitive than using um, coding. It's probably right, they stuck to the ICD-9 codes, and when they these were changed to ICD-10, they stopped collecting, that's why they picked the time period to do it. So I think that's quite a valid way to find a, a cohort as well. Um, they clearly gave inclusion and exclusion criteria, which may or may not have been what you'd have wanted to include and exclude. So they've not included anyone um, over 30 days when they came in. So they're not looking at late presentations. They stuck between these five years. As I say, that's to do with the ICD codes. So they've clearly explained why they picked that time period. And then they've excluded people who had other surgery than in arterial switch, so the stellies and atrial switches. 
um, they excluded cases where the hospitals hadn't been giving their full data over the time period to this database. And they also took out all the cases that had ECMO preoperatively, or if they had a late switch. So I don't know whether that's them. I mean, they did still, they identified 2,271 patients, so a good number, and they ended up excluding about 100 and just over 100. So they excluded them for the reasons we've said, really, if the hospital hadn't been recording their data, or they also said if they had done less than 10 cases over that time period, they excluded them. So it probably would have been ideal to keep those cases in, but they still kept a good number. Um, it might have just proved a point that hospitals doing very few cases had worse outcomes, so I think it would have been good to keep them in. Then um, they've said if they've had age more than 30, they've excluded them, and they have gone on to explain that because they are looking at the kind of more typical switches I done earlier. And they excluded cases where they had ECMO before surgery. Again, it might have been good to keep them in. That is kind of risking diagnostic purity bias, where we're saying that more sick children's data is excluded. But they have justified that saying that's not, not their routine care. So just again back to critical appraisal. I think um, so far the study is so far the study um, seems to be set up in quite a good way. You can use these critical appraisal tools like CAS, but they are quite lengthy. But the main thing is at the beginning to say, is it worth reading this paper? Um, and I thought the question was good and the cohort was accepted, uh, recruited quite well. It's a cohort study, it would be impossible to do a RCT, it would be totally unethical. So in levels of evidence, it is quite high up there. And more than that, they've used this clinical registry, which has got good and bad things about it, but there is a move towards using larger data sets and just um, better than using a single sensor, for sure. I think the problem with them, which they do identify later, is that if you have missing data, you can't fill that in because you can't go back to EPR and things. So you've just got the data you've got in the registry and you can't really um, fill in any gaps. But it is good for looking across different hospitals and institutes and benchmarking. And it is good for looking at ways overall to improve outcomes. And so it's quite high in the level of evidences. Um, so the exposures, they've clearly explained them. They said the primary exposure is the age when these babies had the switch done. And then they've looked at um, whether they had a septostomy, whether they were on prostin, whether they were ventilated, and whether they were on inotropes. Um, then they've, they've gone on further to kind of make sure that they were actual exposures by saying if they just had transient, say, ventilation for transfer into the hospital, or if they just had a brief period of inotropes, they've not included those as an exposure, um, which I think is probably the right thing to do. I don't know what everyone else thinks, but I think it's the right thing to do. And they identified before they started any of the analysis their main outcomes, which was death, length of stay, and um, probably less interesting to us, but still important, and it's an American study as well, so focused on cost as well. Um, they didn't include other post-op complications because these, uh, really, so you do using the database, I don't think they would have had to identify them. It would have been maybe good to look at things like neurological outcomes or other morbidities, but they weren't able to do that. Um, so uh, then they've kind of gone on to try and minimise, you know, confounding factors affecting the results. And that's why they've restricted to this actual neonatal period, patients having to switch in that period. And that's why they took out the cases on ECMO. And they have adjusted for things they knew where there was a genetic syndrome that they were very in. Um, but they didn't really adjust for if they'd had NEC before surgery, if they were septic, and we do know these things have impact, we've seen that in our cases here. So that was a bit of a shame, I think. And then they didn't go into looking at those patients. The slides are not changing for us. Are you on the first slide? Yeah, you need to reside, uh, re share. Re share. From when? We're, we're, we're on the two slides before. I'm Ooh. sorry, I just try and share the slides again. As you can see, uh, full uh, slide mode. Okay, just leave it like that because then we can see it. Okay. Is that okay? I'm missing you guys. <laughs> oh, they don't want to see that. Okay. Uh, I have to choose what to share. 
patient's anatomy, preoperative anatomy, like the size of the atrial communication or how um, desaturated they were. Can you still see that? That one second. Okay. Yeah, please. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, the way they've looked at their data is they've used mixed effects models. So that means that they could put in the um, confounding factors, which are then become known as covariates, into these models so they can then look more at the associations of things they're interested in. So that's the statistics, basically. So I won't really go through all these, but just to say they've pulled out the things that probably are relevant. So they, in the model, they put as their potential confounders the age of the child, the gender, race, prematurity, um, genetic syndromes. As I say, they missed out certain things when they were doing analysis because they said they couldn't collect the data. <clears throat> and then in terms of the hospital and possible confounders, they talked about the number of surgeries done within the hospital and they didn't directly look at the number of switches done, but they said there is a strong correlation between the total number of surgeries and the number of switches, so they used that. And for the cost data, they um, basically used a benchmark of $2,015 and then adjusted the cost to that level, kind of looking at inflation and things, and they use that across the whole of the study. So the statistics were basically, as I said, they had a hypothesis, which was that um, delayed switch would be associated with using more adjuvant therapies and worse outcomes, and then they did three models, <clears throat> looking first at the association of patient factors, hospital factors, and then directly at the age of at death and age of switch. Um, in the paper, they talk about these postdoc analysis and secretary analysis, and I've not really gone into them because I think these are just what well, they say themselves are exploratory. So really, they just got the data and messed around to see what would come out as positive. But I think without, they didn't adjust for multiple comparisons of big risk given type one errors or false positives. So I say I've not really given much weight to that. Um, if they do multiple comparisons, they should have really done like a, a bond for only or some adjustment to lower the p-value really, but they didn't. So I think that was just a bit of an exercise to see what else might come out. So they put their results into four sections. First, they described the, the whole cohort of patients from all the hospitals together. And then they looked at the variability of um, how treatment was done between hospitals and the outcomes in hospitals. And then they've looked, then they've gone on to do the models and look at associations between patient factors and outcomes or hospital factors and outcomes. And then, as I said, I didn't really put the other results in. So they ended up with 2,159 patients after they'd excluded them for reasons we've been through. And that was from 40 hospitals, because again, they excluded some hospitals who hadn't had many cases. Um, they were predominantly um, white in race, and that's probably just reflecting the population, I imagine. They were predominantly male, which reflects the male predisposition for TGA. Um, few of them were pre And around half of all the patients, whatever hospital they were from, had a septostomy. And just over half had um, prostin. And then there's a bit more variation in the, the less had ventilation and a few had antropes. But from all these 2,159 patients, the median age when they had their switch was six days and the interquartile range four to nine. So most of them having it really around the first week. Um, and then when they looked at outcomes, Across the board, again, the mortality was 2.8%, so in keeping with the quota figures of less than 5%. Um, I get, I'm probably slightly less interested in less length of hospital stay, but they did a length of hospital stay of 12 days as a median. They put this um, 
box and whisker put in, which is maybe it's okay to understand, but it's not the clearest, I guess. So they're basically saying the middle line is um, they looked at basically the number in each hospital. So say one hospital, or if I look at the prostin, the median hospital gave prostin to 67% of their patients having a switch. But the range between hospitals was really large for prostin. So it's, the interquartile range is 36 to 78. So some hospitals are hardly ever giving it, is what this means. And in one hospital, 78% of the patients were on prostin. So um, probably the the thing I kind of focused on there was the septostomy, which the median hospital was having a septostomy 48% of their patients. So they've plotted that in a different way as well, saying each hospital's figures. So at the lower end, in one hospital, only 21% of patients had a septostomy, whereas in hospitals that did the most, it was around 80. But if you look, most of them are having about half their patients have insectostomy, which is the majority of the bars, if that makes sense. And um, they did some correlation. So they did one, the only one they showed the graph of was the um, age of switch and the number of cases within a hospital. And it's really showing that the more cases a hospital does, the quicker they do their switch. It's what that, so the, the kind of slope of the line is showing how strongly they correlate. And um, they didn't show the graph for the septostomy, but they're still saying that the more um, cases a hospital does, oh, I'm sorry, the more likely a hospital does a septostomy, the more likely they are to do the switch later. So that was the two things that came out of those correlations, really. Um, so it looks like do them sooner if you do a lot of surgeries, and if you do a septostomy, have a bit of delay in doing the switch. Um, then we looked at the patient characteristics and outcomes. There's, I say they present a lot of um, data, but I've kind of tried to focus on what the important bits are. They did, they did models, as we say, to try to look at confounding factors in the models as well. Um, and the positive, the kind of significant results were that having a septostomy really does lower your um, chance of mortality. So the p-value is really significant there. The odds ratio is 0.32, so having septostomy, less chance of dying. And having a genetic condition increases your risk of dying, again, quite significantly. P-value is quite, quite significant, and the odds ratio is 2.84. So that's, an, that's increasing your risk, whereas the septostomy is reducing it, if that makes sense. Um, the model results they've put in as a table, and it is, there is some interest in the length of stay and cost, but as I say, focusing on mortality more, again, it's just showing the same as the previous slide. So genetic conditions and prematurity are bad, and septostomy is good, it's the basic summary. Can't, and having anotropes or ventilation or prostin, not really significant to your mortality. So then they looked at hospital practice and mortality. Um, and as we said, if you, if you do a later switch, the odds ratio for mortality is increased. The p-value is not so significant, but it is still within significance. So that came up there. And then um, the more surgery done in a hospital, you have a lower chance of death or low mortality. And that's, again, p-value is just about significant for that. But no other characteristics of the hospital affect mortality. Um, so that's the table of their results for looking at hospital practice and length of stay and cost, which uh, I think that's really what you'd expect. If you're ventilated, you have a longer length of stay and your stay costs more. If you have a septostomy, you have a shorter length of stay and your cost actually is less, which is probably slightly interesting. And they, they, they've discussed their results and kind of said what, we've, what you can infer from the results, which is that um, they already recognise that studies have shown this association with birth weight and coronary anatomy and mortality. Um, they already know that hospital experience and surgeon experience can lower your mortality. And then they've looked at other preoperative care aspects which they think are modifiable. I'd probably maybe argue that some of them, such as um, needing anotropes and ventilation, more than preoperative modifiable factors are a kind of sign of how sick the check baby is. So, Possibly more of a confounder than an actual thing to look at as a <clears throat> modifiable factor. I'm not sure what everyone else thinks on that. Um, 
this study's found a big variation in practice, like if you remember looking at that graph of septostomies, the bar chart, some hospitals are hardly doing any, some are doing them in 80% of their cases, so big variations um, in who gets a septostomy and who has prostate, etc. And in the timing of the switch, which is also interesting. Um, I think there's been discussions about timing of switching by several studies before, still not clear exactly what is the best time. And uh, there's other factors that affect the outcome. Some people think delaying a while before you do the switch, like let's the um lets there be a kind of period of stability, lets you find out if there's other things going on, such as congenital problems, and lets the circulation kind of transition. But it's hard to say exactly what is the best time to delay. Um, most of the results are from single central st studies, and some have shown that operating very early on doesn't increase your risk of mortality. Um, this study found that an early switch didn't increase your risk of mortality, but then again, neither did a later age. So again, a bit inconclusive. Um, going back to the septostomy, that was quite clear from the this study that it lowers your mortality, it lowers your cost, and it lowers your length of hospital stay. So in the past, people might have said, oh, having a septostomy, the risks associated are quite high, risk of stroke, risk of other things, um, brain injuries, but it doesn't seem to, they haven't directly looked at that, so can't really comment, they haven't looked at neurological outcomes, so maybe a bit of a shame, but it is definitely better for mortality. And there's a massive variation in what hospitals are doing in this study with um, septostomy. So as usual, the conclusion there is more research. Um, the other adjuncts, I, as I said, I don't remember you could call them adjuncts, or were they more confounding factors that these were more unwell patients that needed processing and needed ventilating? So um, they didn't really, the results were kind of um, not that significant, and that's in keeping with other studies which have had equivocal results. They've gone through their limitations and I probably agree with them. They've recognised that using a database they haven't got all the information um, they didn't have, they didn't know about the anatomy, they didn't know if the patient was septic, etc. But they have said that across the board that probably equals out is how they've got around that. And I think it would have been better to know that, but not possible. Um, they didn't know if patients were diagnosed prenatally and that we know does lower the well improve your outcome. So that's the, another limitation of this study. And obviously we're just looking at the short-term outcome of as they leave the hospital, we're not looking at the overall picture of health of these children down the line. However, I think TGA after repair, we see good outcomes, so perhaps the longer term isn't as relevant in this study. Um, they've said that because it's from these children's hospitals, it limits generalizability. I probably wouldn't, wouldn't particularly agree with that because I don't think you'd be having a switch in any other kind of hospital, so it's probably it probably is generalizable. Um, and then they, by taking out these late switches and children that needed ECMO, they say they've kept the sample homogenous, which probably makes the results a bit more robust. And that's their conclusions, which I won't read because we've kind of already highlighted them, but just that there's variability and some aspects like your time of your switch and using your septostomy can influence the outcomes, but again, further research needed. So our European guidelines um, do say that we should try and get the switch done within three weeks. So their timing, this American study was, what did they say now, the medium was around um, six days. So well below that and difficult to say whether um, it's any worse leaving it any longer. So then um, I've just looked at our data from the last year, which Jen kind of pulled out from this week. So, they, this study, the hospitals are doing around eight cases a year, so we're doing double that, so the experience is quite good here. Obviously, I wouldn't draw conclusions from this because it's one year's worth of data, but we had 16 cases and 11 of these were antenatally diagnosed. The weight at the time of um, switch was uh, around 3.5 kilos, with the, the lowest weight recorded 2.6 to 4. Again, we see the male predisposition, and again, we see the ethnic um, split, which again is probably to do with the population more than the condition. So we do have data that four of our cases had um, neck before they had a switch. And our surgery, at first I did the mean, which brings us out at 20 days, still within the three weeks, but obviously it's quite high. But then 
if you look at it as a median, which is probably a more fair way to look, because in this data from last year, we've got a switch done at 52 days, which was a child which didn't even present until, I think, three weeks of age. So it's probably more fair to look at the um, median and interquartile range, which means we're doing them around just over two weeks, median age being 16 days. And we're doing a septostomy in 81% of our cases, so we're kind of similar to the hospitals that were doing the septostomies in 80% in the study we saw. Um, I, I, I put age at discharge because I didn't get as far as getting the actual admission date, so I don't think it's fair to say length of stay. So I don't think we can make much of that, and obviously we've got some very long length of stays, but as I say, we've had late presentations, etc. So um, yeah, that's all I can say on that. So we had post op ECMO in two cases, and we had two deaths, which is it looks like a high percentage, but it's only one year's worth of cases, and I think you'd have to look at them individually. So the two deaths were, one was antenatally diagnosed, one was postnatally diagnosed. Both needed ECMO after the switch, both were male. They, one had a um, switch at 13 days and one at 24, but I think, importantly, they both had comorbidities. Um, I think one of them, well, we haven't discussed one as yet, and the other one had neonatal infections before surgery and then had a bad neurological yeah so we had infections comorbidities okay. so i say that it looks a high percentage just a small bit of data and if you look at the reasons that there so that's that's all data i don't know if anybody's got any questions yeah it's really nice data set oh 25 percent of next uh, yeah. prior surgery yeah. Mm. Uh, so we can start discussion. If anybody can uh, would like to ask anything or comment, please. So Oleg, can I can I start? No. Yeah, yeah, we can start discussion, please, drop down. Uh, Sophia, thank you. That was uh, and, and as usual, uh, we are learning so much from you about how to analyze a paper, and um, very impressive. And I, and I'm still reading, but not analyzing the way that I should analyze like you do it. Um, do you have any, maybe I was late for the presentation, but there was any definition of what means the definition for delay? And two is, it appeared to be an overlap of the preoperative intervention, meaning like I suspect that some patients have prostate and septostomy. That is, you know, um, some patients have septostomy and anotropes. And the final one, which is probably we can discuss later, was the, the exclusion criteria is um, it, it probably changed significantly the way that we see the paper. When you, re you remove ECMOs, you remove a patient with comorbidities, etc. Would you be kind to just let me know about the or let us know about if the, what's the definition for a delayed switch? So um, they have excluded anyone that had a switch later than 30 days. Um, I think that's what they're calling as a delay, but their, their results are showing very early switches really compared to other practice, so their median was in six days, I think. Uh, I've used the word delayed switch, I don't think they've used it, they've just excluded right. switch days in 30 days, yeah. Um, and do you know if the, the overlap of, because if if we look at our practice, probably many patients start on prostate as soon as they are born. They have the septostomy. Um, in many of them, we probably stop the prostate and carry on with that. Is, is that some of them probably will have two interventions, meaning they will have prostate plus uh, septostomy in that, or it's difficult to identify them? Well, they haven't um, reported the results in that way. They've looked at each, we call them adjuvant therapies. They've looked at each one kind of individually and the effects. And then they've done it in models, so I suppose for each one, hopefully they've adjusted for other factors. But they haven't said having like they could have said, I guess, having um, prostin and a septostomy is that is that the best way to get a good outcome? But they haven't done it that way. They've looked at each thing individually. That was my understanding of this in the paper. Um, but they did use models. So and as I say afterwards, they've done this postdoc analysis where they've done a bit more about that. But I didn't think they could give much weight to those results because. They didn't lower their p-value and they just kind of looked at everything together. So maybe that's a bit to read again to see if 
doing two things together gives you a good outcome. I don't think I could say that from this paper. The statistics. Um, yeah, sorry, there was a third question as well. Yeah, sorry, the, the third, I, I think that the paper answer the, the question that's saying, yes, there is different practice all around the country and different parts, yeah. but the, uh, which probably is not relevant to the paper, uh, but but it's important for a very subjective analysis of the paper, at least when you exclude some significant groups, then you don't know if you include the groups, how many of them were operated late or have egg, sorry, ECMO because they were coming early, late, and those are not included in the mortality yeah. uh, on the overall mortality. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree. I think that was a bit of a um, possibly a bit of a flaw because they've tried to make it like a homogenous group of patients. But really, if you want it to be generalizable, I think they should have kept in patients that needed ECMO and they should have defined if they had sepsis, etc. And they needed, I mean, the babies needing them um, anotropes preoperatively, they must have had something else or they were unwell, weren't they? So. Um, they tried to simplify it and make it more homogenous, but in so doing they've missed out. It's not as generalizable, is it? Because we do have patients that are quite unwell before, and it would be nice to know what affects their outcome as well. Yeah. So they've explained why they've done that, and it, I, I think it was, I don't know if everyone else thinks, but I think it was quite a good paper compared to some, and they've used quite good um, data sources and things, but I think they've done quite a good job with it, but it leaves some questions unanswered yeah. about things like that, like, et cetera. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. I don't know if other people want to ask, probably. Have you finished? No more questions. Hi, Sophia. I've got a question. Nayan here. Hi. Hi. Uh, excellent presentation, I have to say. Uh, the data is a lot clearer when you presented than when I read it. Um, so <laughs> my the difficulty with any retrospective study is making a you know cause and effect um, yeah. sort of association so the difficulty then is to say when they've said uh, that balloon atrial septostomy is better overall for patients but uh, how do you did you they didn't give us any details about the timing of surgery in those who've had septostomy isn't it so in a way if, if you imagine a patient who's um, Who's um, had septos? Who's not had septostomy and had delayed surgery? But the the hemodynamics and the the more hypoxic, you would expect uh, a worse outcome in them. Uh, so, how, was there any details in the paper about septostomy versus timing of surgery, which would be helpful to see yeah. what they did in that group? So they did say that having a septostomy means that you have your um, switch later. But obviously their median age of switch was still quite early. I mean, um, reading the paper overall, the kind of bottom line to me was like, having a septostomy is good, and then having a switch early is good, and putting the two together is the best thing to do. So, you know, switch surgery, I mean, septostomy surgery, and then lower outcome, better, more, lower mortality. But they, they have looked at the two together and said, having a septostomy makes your surgery later, but still improves your mortality. I mean, for me, the most that was the most significant result. That it's a really good thing to have a septostomy. <laughs> and obviously, I think the um, time of surgery might end up then being slightly delayed, but it doesn't affect the overall mortality, is what this mm. paper said. But they're not looking at big delays. It excluded very late surgery anyway, and they're they're not within thirty days anyway. Yeah, yeah even so, with best septostomy yeah. or without. Uh, what my impression was that if you didn't have a septostomy, you had in very early days. I mean, day one, day two, day three. Yeah. But if you had a septostomy, you delayed it by a few more days. And the overall median age was about six yeah. days or something yeah. overall. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't separate into median age without septostomy, yeah. with septostomy. That yeah. would have answered my well, They must have done because they have um, related the two together, but they haven't presented it in that way. Right. Okay, so. Yeah, because they have said that it is later when you have a septostomy, but I didn't see it presented as clearly as that, which would have been good, I think. Yeah. Um, Maybe something we could look at here, I guess. From, any, any other questions? From I think that one, one of the... Uh, all these papers who are come from... Uh, I think that these are mainly American papers, American hospitals, is how important is the health system 
uh, and probably maybe it's not as relevant in arterial switch, but it, it, it in fact it, it can make a difference is that there is a significant market competition. So you are one hospital in front of and the other side of the street, the other one. If you are going to delay for three or four days, the patient goes next door. And and that's the that's the market. Uh, yeah. And uh, probably not so much in neonates, I suspect, but in, in tetralogies and ABSDs. And that's what drives so much uh, the practice in in some of the American hospitals. Which is different from the health system in the UK, I guess, or Europe, but uh, it's very dif difficult to measure. Yeah, and they do focus more on um, cost than we do in. I mean, it is important cost, I know, but it's more of a focus in American studies, I think, than ours. Did you have the number for the cost or no? Yeah, they did. The, they did analyze cost quite a lot. I just didn't focus on it particularly, but. And can share that as I share it? No, you didn't put touch costs. Um, so I didn't see costs. Any comments from cardiology colleagues? Uh, can I ask a question? Quick, there's Crawford here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Sophia. That's great. Just did, did they mention in the paper or did when you looked at our details? Was there any discussion or, or mention on the length of time on prostin? I just see our, our neck rate is 25%. Is there any link between length of time on prostin and outcomes? Um, well, they've only cleared people that were on prostin for, they've excluded them on it for a very short period of time. That's the way they've done it. So say if they were just on it initially or around the time of surgery. So they haven't put the number of days, but they've, so they broke it into kind of three groups, so yeah, they have sort of done that. As I say, because it was, because surgery median age was six days, um, I think they put it at three days again. Yeah. I don't think I put it in directly, but they, because they excluded people that were on prostin just for like a short period of time, you could say they'd have to go on a couple of days to make it into having that as an adjuvant. So yeah, I think there's a section in the paper about um, whether they included that as a kind of factor, the prostin, and they had to be on it for a couple of days. But they haven't given the exact results of how long it's gone. Okay. Sophia, do you think that um, following Crawford's um, in, um, question, it, it would be very relevant for uh, for our practice, but not just for transposition, but in general, uh, what is our incidence of, and we tried several cardiology registrars to try to do it, the incidence of neck in the cardiac population, in the neonatal cardiac population, uh, and probably we can either relate it or not to prostate. But we we see quite a lot, not not just uh, sorry, not just transpositions, uh, aortic arch, etc. And maybe we might be able to identify if it's prostin related or not, or it's just a hypothesis. But I think that will be a good thing to follow. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I mean, they haven't really um, looked at neck in the study, but um, they're saying there's risks associated with using therapies, and obviously prostin is something we take, you know, we put that on and we produce it and it would be good to really look at what's happening when we do that definitely in terms of neck and especially when although they've not looked at it we've seen neck have effects on them outcomes on them so yeah I'm sure it's quite easy to do as well okay I think uh, thank you very much uh, just a final comment I want to make we had earlier a bit of a debate about timing of surgery isn't it? It was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah, it was, and it's, it's good that you picked up this this paper. And then it, it's a nice paper. I know there could be some bias, but it's a large multi-center study, large volume, so it removes some bias as well. Um, and always we try to reflect on our practice, but it, it kind of reassured me what we are doing is probably right for our population, our settings, and our practice as well, that acetostomy followed by surgery. Um, 
better utilizing the resources and then it is quite reassuring this paper. Yeah. And for me, I mean personally, I think that second week is the best week for the switch. Septostomy yeah. followed by switch. And, and, and it's good you show that we more or less follow that pattern 16 days. Yeah. Um, you, you have to include the weekends and all those things. So probably second week is something we try to do, uh, which probably is, is good. It is it's reassuring for me. Some positives. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. It's good, good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.